It is hard to believe this beautiful beach along the central California coastline was used for a place to dump rubbish and garbage. Today, it is unlawful for man to dump his garbage on the beach. However, the law still permits man to haul it out to sea and dump it. The bottom of the ocean looks pretty much the same as this beach. Another man-made pollutant has been finding its way into the sea for a long time. The water along the California coastline looks pure and clean. Yet it contains a deadly poison that is suspected of being responsible for wiping out the California sardine industry, along with certain other forms of marine life and bird species. It started in 1944 when the pesticide DDT came into use. It was applied on a large scale to crops in central and coastal areas of California. Through drainage ditches into natural waterways, the deadly chemical found its way eventually into the sea. Scientific tests would someday prove the Santa Barbara Channel water to contain the highest, most poisonous pesticide level in the world. By 1949, the California sardine fishing industry was near collapse. Spotter aircraft were employed to assist vessels in finding the sardines. One such plane and pilot was known as the Observer, a pioneer in aerial fish discovery. During the next 19 years, the red and white Luscombe would be a familiar sight to commercial fishermen along the California coastline. With the growing scarcity of sardines, the fleet turned to other species, such as anchovies, bonita, and mackerel. From the spotter plane, schools of fish appear as shadows, just a little darker than the surrounding water. When a boat is in the proper position, the observer gives the command to release the net. A buoy, tossed overboard with a rope attached, helps pull the net into the water. The circle is completed with a school of anchovies in the center. The two wings of the net are pulled simultaneously around two rubber-tired drums. It's mighty hard work. This man lost 80 pounds after signing on as a crew member. The operation has taken one hour. The fish, well, they're now in the bag, so to speak. A bald eagle watches the operation, hopeful of finding a stray fish. The seagulls arrive also, and the brown pelicans eagerly pitch in and help the fishermen save the anchovies. This catch was made in the Santa Barbara Channel in 1949. By the year 1969, anchovies and mackerel caught in the same area will have such a high DDT content as to render them unfit for human consumption. In a few years, the pelicans will start laying soft-shelled eggs. Tests will prove that this was caused by pesticides in the bird's diet of fish. White sea bass were plentiful just a few years ago. The school you see here is in the Santa Barbara Channel. The observer is directing a boat toward the fish. Again, a buoy goes up. Sea bass are caught with a gill net, which is almost 2,000 feet in length. The net is coming in now, and there are the first fish. Sea bass will average about 20 pounds each. In a few years, white sea bass will suffer the same fate as brown pelicans. Barracuda were also plentiful. It was not uncommon for the observer to count over 100 schools within a three-hour flight over the Santa Barbara Channel. 
This happy fisherman never dreamed that someday the Barracuda would virtually disappear from California waters. From Point Conception to San Diego, Bonita fish were so abundant that most vessels were on limits of 15 tons each to avoid overloading the canneries. With the skiff overboard, the circle begins. This net is called a purse seine, so named because the bottom is pulled together like a woman's purse. The net is lifted from the water by means of an overhead power pulley and restacked on the turntable. In about one hour, it is back on the boat with the fish in the braille section. The bonita are packed in San Pedro canneries for human consumption. After the sardine industry collapsed, a few canneries in Monterey Bay turned to processing the big Baskin shark for oil and fish meal. This fishery also failed and was discontinued in 1950 due to a scarcity of shark. The observer also worked with shark boats in the Santa Barbara Channel. Baskin sharks were once plentiful in California waters, as many as 2,000 being recorded in a single day. The shark this man is about to harpoon is in the Santa Barbara Channel, just offshore from the city of Montecito. Baskin shark are harmless, feeding on plankton only. They have never been known to attack man. A perfect throw! They have another big one on the line. That tough one-inch manila rope should hold him. The large Baskin shark may weigh over five tons and exceed a length of 30 feet. Baskin shark fishing is dangerous work. Crew members must be careful not to become entangled in the coil of rope. A crew member stands ready with a rifle. Because there were no processing plants in the Santa Barbara area, only the liver was taken. The carcass sinks to the bottom and becomes food for crabs and lobsters. The liver may weigh 1,800 pounds. It contains a valuable ingredient used in the making of perfume. Then there were those sportsmen who thought the rope was more sporting than the harpoon. <laughs> That's the way it goes. The big ones always seem to get away. In 1949, when the observers started flying for the commercial fleet, fishing was still pretty good. With the vanishing of the sardines, markets were developing for other varieties of fish. For a few more years, it would still be considerable activity. Most of the boats would stay in business for a time. But with each passing year, all species of fish become more scarce. 
boats were sold and canneries closed. The common question on the waterfront was, where did the fish go? Some said the kelp cutters were responsible, that mowing the kelp was bad for the fish. Almost everyone pointed the finger of guilt toward the offshore oil drilling platforms as being responsible for the fish shortage. Others said the commercial fishing boats had put all the fish in cans. When the abalone shellfish became scarce, the abalone fishermen said the sea otters were to blame for the shortage. However, no one thought of pollution. The observer would fly over California's coastal waters for 19 years. He would see the population of various species of fish decline. By the year 1968, sardines were down 100%. Mackerel, 85%. Bonita, 85%. Sea bass, 95%. Barracuda, 95%. And anchovies, 75%. The observer would also see the juvenile brown pelican vanish from California because the adult birds were laying soft shelled eggs. The bald eagle would also disappear. Cannery Row in Monterey, which once packed over four million pounds of sardines in a single season, would become a ghost street of deserted buildings and broken windows. After 19 years over the big nets, due to a scarcity of fish, an era comes to an end. The observer bids farewell to one of the few remaining vessels and retires from the business of aerial fish spotting. Then came January 28, 1969. Work crews began cleaning up crude oil which drifted on shore from an oil platform in the Santa Barbara Channel. Four and one half million dollars were spent on restoring the beaches to their natural beauty. Birds were hard hit. 1,700 died because of the oil. Hundreds of others were saved in the bird laundry. Special detergents remove the oil from their feathers. And after cleaning, birds of a feather were placed in cages to dry. These cormorants are eager to be about their business of fishing. Are there any fish left? Did the oil spill cause a commercial fishing disaster? Is the Santa Barbara Channel a dead sea? In the interest of marine research, the observer is again over the Santa Barbara Channel looking for the answer. Special equipment on board the plane consists of a movie camera mounted under the tail, another movie camera mounted on the wing strut, plus a still camera in the cockpit. For nine months, the observer will fly the same route shown on the map. The survey started on March 14, 1969, 45 days after the oil spill. The first sighting occurred one mile offshore from Goleta, California. Three gray whales on their way back from the waters off Mexico to the Bering Sea in Alaska. Gray whales travel to Mexico each year to have their young. The observer would record a total of 57 gray whales before the migration was over. While traveling to and from Mexico, a whale will occasionally become stranded, like the one you will see around the next bend. A 
second discovery was made on the same day, March 14th, in the vicinity of the oil spill. Ten Baskin sharks were spotted. Some were traveling in pairs. All had their mouths open and were feeding on plankton. A third sighting on the same day was made two miles offshore from Carpinteria, California. Dark shadows were visible near the surface of the ocean. The shadows turned out to be small schools of jack mackerel. An oil slick in the upper part of the picture appears to have no effect on the fish. The still camera was used for steady purposes. Schools of mackerel averaged four to six tons each, actually too small for commercial operations. Two days later on March 16th, mackerel were discovered offshore from Santa Barbara City. A fishing boat arrived and began working. During March and April, the boat netted 250 tons of mackerel. Now this is considered poor fishing, but better than the previous year. Santa Barbara Harbor can be seen in the background. A large oil slick extends across the center of the picture. The same day on March the 16th, a shark boat harpooned two Baskin sharks. One is now tied alongside the vessel. The survey has now progressed into the month of May, 1969. During May, schools of anchovies moved into the channel from Point Conception to Port Wainimi. Some schools were found in deep water. The white specks are seagulls working on the fish. Other schools were very near shore. This odd-shaped school is in very shallow water near the Gaviota Pier. Schools of fish in shallow water are easy to see against the white sands of the ocean bottom. Here at Refugio Beach State Park are three schools of anchovies. During the month of May, 20,310 tons of anchovies were recorded. We now visit the island of San Miguel. In June of 1969, newspaper and magazine editorials hinted that baby seals on this island might be starving to death due to the absence of fish caused by the oil spill. Whatever the causes of death among the baby seals, the observer found it hard to believe that they were dying due to lack of food, and so decided to investigate. A herd of sea elephants appear to be quite content. This old sea lion, gray with age, doesn't seem to be suffering, but rather enjoying life. A large group of mother seals and their babies appear quite normal and carry on as usual. A group of well-fed, fat little puppies are having fun in this tide pool. Still other baby seals explore a mysterious cave. Well, this one is just lying around soaking up vitamin D. At times, they gather in groups and in general seem to be having a good time. However, the baby seals are in danger, not from starvation, but from their own kind. Here comes Father Seal, and the old bull is roaring mad. 
He will crush to death all baby seals that are too young or too slow to move from his pack. Another bull has stopped by to admire his family. The babies scamper for their lives. If this group of puppies were a little younger, dozens would have been crushed to death. This mother seal will look for her baby when she is dry. She may find it crushed to death like this one. Back in the plane again, the survey continues. During the months of July and August, on the south side of Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa Islands, schools of Bonita and Blue Fen Tuna were spotted. The schools were large enough for commercial operation. Purse singers from San Pedro arrived on the scene and caught several hundred tons. In September and October, Bonita appeared in fair numbers on the coast, mainly off the shore from Gaviota, El Capitan, and Carpinteria. The commercial boats netted several hundred tons. Flights continued through November and December, at which time the last entry was made in the law. The question, how did the oil spill affect schools of fish in the Santa Barbara Channel? Jack Mackerel, 6,826 tons. Anchovies, 337,360 tons. Bluefin tuna, 461 tons. Barracuda, 47 tons. Bonita, 10,951 tons. Totals, 1969. 355,645 tons. 1968, 33,943 tons. Information gained from the survey shows the fish population rose over 1,000% in 1969. Further research and study will be necessary to understand this unusual phenomenon. The majority of the increase being anchovies. Bonita we'll decline 10% a steady pattern over the last 10 to 15 years. The geographic and seasonal occurrences of fish in the channel and around the adjacent islands was in harmony with past records. Based on this data, it must be assumed the January 28, 1969 oil spill had no adverse effect on school fish population in the